Well, welcome to my podcast, Trending Topic with BB, and welcome to everybody watching. I feel like Diana, I see Diana's already out there ready to go in the chat, so that's awesome. So welcome. Uh, I know it's late on the East Coast, so thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Brooke Brown. I'm the host of this podcast, and my lovely guest, John, I'm going to introduce in a second here, and definitely check out his Twitter and Instagram. Uh, but uh, before I get there, there are some, uh, I just want to remind people out there, when you listen to this podcast coming up Monday in audio form, uh, if you can give it a favorable rating, and then I will keep, uh, I'm going to put a lot of links in the episode description also to John's podcast uh, for you to check out, because we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So thank you, John, for joining me, and welcome to my podcast. Hey, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone out there in uh, in live streaming land. <laughs> awesome. And uh, I do know that uh, you were just on, uh, you had a lovely chat with Diana and a few of the ladies for Virtual Hellcon, which was our fan-run Lucifer convention. Yeah, it was super um, cool. Yeah, and, and it was a great interview. So definitely, if you haven't watched that, check it out on that YouTube channel. But for those that don't know, let's kind of do a little bit background. Uh, I know you started kind of, you were in a couple bands and you have a m musical background and then you, you, you have an extensive career in acting. So for those that haven't checked out your podcast yet or heard the other interview, kind of just start with your background. Wow, okay. Um, well, I, uh, I was a kid, I grew up in New Jersey. And um, I started off uh, with music, and uh, music for me was always um, a, a passion. It's always been something that I've uh, kind of gone to first in life. Um, I, I started out playing uh, in rock and roll bands um, in my neighborhood. Uh, there was a bunch of neighborhood kids that were up to no good, and. Uh, we decided one day that we wanted to, uh, af after we, we all were able to get MTV on, uh, on cable, when we finally got cable in our town, we, we finally got MTV, we all wanted to be rock stars. And so um, everybody kind of took up their instruments. Um, uh, you know, the guitars went pretty quick and the drums went pretty quick. Nobody wanted to play bass. So I got stuck playing bass. Um, and what's interesting is, you know, I, I turned out, uh, I ended up loving, loving playing bass guitar. And um, so, you know, I, I was in a, a, a little uh, band growing up when I was about, um, you know, 14 or 15 with the neighborhood kids. And then I got more serious about it uh, and kind of bounced from band to band throughout high school. And I found a, a band um, with a, a couple of other kids that were pretty proficient with their instruments and we started a, a band that that played contemporary like um stuff like uh at the time because we got to talk about like this is around like 1987 80 88 like that was around the time when this band happened i i was in um a band called sunsplash and we had two different shows we would do um a contemporary show that was uh, a lot of bands from the time, like REM and U2 and, and The Cure and bands like that. But we also had a full-on Grateful Dead show uh, that we did um, that actually was really popular and did really well. And, and we took that all over uh, New Jersey and New York City. And, and we, we made a nice little living doing that. And the bands kind of like broke up and... Everybody went off to college, and I didn't know what to do, so I guess you know, I decided to go to college, too. And while I was at college, I, I discovered acting. Um, but I've, I've always still, uh, you know, stuck to music, and, I, and while I was acting, I was also playing in bands. Um, some were good. Some were absolutely terrible. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know... It, being in a band is a lot of fun. It, it's it's a it's a great way to learn how to how to work with other people, and and it's the most fun you can have with your clothes on. Awesome. So I have a few follow up questions because sure. uh, not to age you, 
but Diana put this in uh, <laughs> the chat, and I was born around the same time. But okay, I, uh, my love for the '80s music, I want to get into because you yeah, mentioned so that's one of my favorite things in the world to talk about. So I'm all I'm all for it. Okay, so you mentioned in previous podcast episodes or other interviews that you you, you love the like synthesizer side because I, I do want to pick your brain about your 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 proficiency in Ableton because I'm I'm struggling oh. with that. Okay. But uh, before we get to that, I want to talk about the influence. You talk about the the synthesizers in music. I'm also a huge into like freestyle and um also the new wave i i mean depeche mode when they did their last tour i had to go see it and it was epic mm -hmm. um and i hope they tour again and obviously duran duran has new music out and yeah. all kinds of i mean u2 is never gonna stop because bono is amazing so talk about like that influence like in your life as well i know how did that parallel with you falling into bass guitar, because bass guitar is actually my second favorite instrument that I've always wanted to learn because I played saxophone, which is why my oh, oh. screen name is Saxy15 is because I play alto and very sax. And then I love that. That's I great. For, for 17 years, basically. And then I didn't really have time to really get lessons on the bass guitar. So talk about your influences. And like, I know you play other guitars as well, right? Well, I'm not. I'm not very good at, at playing other. I'm primarily a bass player. Um, I can play, you know, a six string acoustic, and, and I can play, you know, electric guitar, and, and you know, but I'm not. I wouldn't consider myself an expert in any fashion when it comes to that. But my primary instrument has always been the bass. Um, as far as influences go, said, um, you know, when I was growing up. Um, AM radio was a big, you know, a big influence on me. I, you know, it was great because I, you would hear all the different types of music. I was, you know, I was born in 1970. So, you know, I, I growing up in the seventies, listening to radio, you had everything, um, all, all the great stuff, you know, from rock and roll to, to soul music, to disco, to all, all, all that stuff. And the one thing that was always, uh, really prominent in those uh, in that music was always the bass guitar for me, but I didn't realize it until later on um, how much it would affect me uh, personally. Um, by the time MTV came around, that that's when I really started to to really um, want to to explore being a musician and, and want to um, to play in bands and, and that kind of thing. Um, Early on, uh, you know, seeing, you know, uh, bands like Duran Duran and and um, um, all and the other bands that were kind of hot at the time on MTV, like the Cars and, and, and a couple of other bands, you know, I really like I really like the bass playing in those in those bands. Um, but you know, I also had kind of like a classic rock. Uh, kind of upbringing too so a lot of the music I was listening to um, was you know early Rolling Stones and, and early um, you know David Bowie and uh, the Beatles and um, uh, bands like Rush and Yes and Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd so those were heavy influences on me and the bass guitar is very prominent in all those bands especially bands like uh, Rush and and Yes um, so a lot of the guys that I grew up with um, had older brothers. I don't have an older brother, but a lot of the guys that I grew up with had older brothers that were really into those bands. And so that was an influence from them um, learning about those bands and, and being told, you know, like, these are the best bass players in the world. You should really listen to them if you want to play bass. And, and I did, and I really appreciated them. And, uh, and so I really liked a lot of that, that, that playing that those guys were doing, like Getty Lee from Rush and Chris Squire from Yes, but and, and also Phil Esh from The Grateful Dead. But I, I didn't really, I really liked those guys. But the bands that I wanted to kind of be in and the music that I really liked was more flashy and more kind of fun. 
um, like Duran Duran and uh, like uh, a lot of a lot of those '80s bands, Level Forty Two and 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 things like that, where uh, you could you could dance to it. It wasn't like you know sit down and get stoned and and just you know zone out to to you know those classic rock bands. And don't get me wrong, Pink Floyd for me is still is one of my top three bands. Um, they're the one of the greatest bands ever and, and a huge influence on me. But but as a bass player, I always kind of tended more to go more towards the the dirty, you know, the dirty kind of dancey, disco-y, you know, um, shake your ass kind of bass playing. <laughs> well, I love, I love that. Well, you mentioned something earlier about falling into the bass as if it's a, the reason I bring it up is that to me, I've always found the you need a bass guitar. You don't always have to have a drummer, but you need like a bass or some sort of other instrument that is part of the rhythm section. Well, you definitely need the bottom end, you know, because yeah. that, that, that's what it is. And, you know, um, bass guitar players and, and drummers get overlooked a lot. Um, and they're primarily the most important part of the band um, because they hold it together. You know, a band like U2 is great. Like, The Edge is a fantastic guitar player. But without, you know, Adam and Larry holding it down, you know, it's just kind of a mess. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, you need to have those guys kind of holding down the, the rhythm section and holding down the backbeat and holding down the low end of, of, of the music. And anytime. Like if a guitar player makes a mistake, nobody really pays any attention to that. If the singer makes a mistake, nobody really pays any attention to that. But if a drummer or a bass player like screws up, the whole thing is thrown off. So, and they and we don't get a lot of credit. Yeah, well, I I agree with <laughs> so, all of that. Like, it's one of those things where I, I uh, you know. Well, it's funny because I play. Like I was, I was a band geek, obviously, and I played in marching bands even through mm -hmm. college, and I played Barry Sachs in college, and um, mm -hmm. our part was always with the tubas or the sousaphones in marching band, and so yeah. my first year in marching band because I went to the University of Arizona, um, we did Tears oh, for brother. Fears. <laughs> Oh, nice. Yeah, so um, my first year in marching band, because I did it my sophomore year, I didn't do it my freshman year, but we, we did our the show that year was Tears for Fears. And I still remember my part. Great band. And that was, great band. Yeah. Great bass player. Yeah. And, I mean, it's I still remember my part from, like, that was, what, 13 years ago or something like that. But, we, yeah, right. it was this week. We were running on the field playing those those like background bass licks because in band. So I just I it's funny how I love the bass guitar, but also I ended up playing Barry Sax because it's you know, parts are written kind of in that that vein of being part of the rhythm section. So right. yeah, so yeah, I always wanted to but anyway, I wanna to get to picking your brain about Ableton because Oh, okay. I know my a lot of people. Before we get to questions, because I know there's some questions in the chat. Um, so, my brain, because of that, I have a hard time with DAW, specifically Ableton. I've tried it. I have a lot of really? ideas of music. I have a lot of music ideas that I want to put into some tracks. Sure. Um, but for some reason, because my brain thinks music theory, I can't get a pass pushing buttons to make okay. music come out. Right. So right. somebody who also plays instrument, can you kind of, I, well, know, I guess everybody's different, but kind of, I've had, I've had a hard time wanting to produce music in a DAW because of my musical background. So could you kind of ease my fear a little yeah, bit? Yeah, no problem. Um, one of for those of you who are listening that don't know what we're talking about, yeah, uh, true. Ableton Live is a uh, music software program that um, is, uh, in my opinion, is one of the best out there. Um, it's for for a guy like me, it's very easy to to use. Um, so 
uh, I naturally gravitated towards it. Um, and the great thing about Ableton is not only can you record music on it, but you can also use it as an instrument, which I tend to do also. Um, and the reason, uh, well, all right, I'll, let me let me back it up. The how I got involved with with Ableton Live was uh, I was in a band uh, called Narco Tourist uh, in Los Angeles um, back in the well, I guess it was like around 2005, 2006, sometime around there. And we were heavily influenced by a lot of the electronic uh, artists. Um, that were around at the time, uh, you know, very, uh, very influenced by bands like, uh, you know, like Depeche Mode and things like that, but, but, but even more, you know, um, later bands like Underworld, The Crystal Method, Chemical Brothers. Um, Prodigy. Uh, the Prodigy, yeah. yeah. Um, all those bands. And, and we so we started getting into using Ableton Live and, and that's what we recorded our record on. And, um, and we used Ableton on stage as our sequencers when we would play live. Um, Ableton is, it, it's very user friendly once you kind of get the hang of it. And, um, you know, for me, um, I love it. I, I, I think it's one of the better programs out there to record music on. And I actually used Ableton when I, I created a web series called The Rolling Soldier and I created all the music for it and I did all of the sound editing and all of the uh, the, the Foley work and, and everything on Ableton. So um, all the music, all the sound, all everything that you hear on my web series, The Rolling Soldier, was done on Ableton Live. So it's not only just for musicians, but it's also used a lot with um, sound design and also with... Um, uh, you know, uh, scoring and, and that kind of thing and, and, and film editing. Um, it's, it's a great program and, and I, 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 you know, you should give it another chance. Um, there's tons of tutorials on YouTube, uh, for beginners on how to get started with it. And I highly recommend, um, doing a deep dive and cause that's what I did because I was, I was always an analog guy. Like my thing was like, I plug my bass into my amp and I play, um, but then when it came to recording an album, you know, because we had to do it on our own, um, we had to learn how to use it. And, we, and the way we learned how to use it was really through YouTube tutorials. And, and, and it, it really was, you know, uh, and now I use it pretty much every day. I love it. I absolutely love it. It's one of my, it's my favorite thing, one of my favorite things in the world. I guess my block on it, because I've, I've, <laughs> I bought a MIDI controller mm -hmm. about three or four years ago, and it came with the light version of 10. Mm -hmm. And I installed it, and then I just hit a mental block, and I think my mental block with producing is that I have a hard time with, I have all these ideas specifically in music, and because of my background, the fact that like I can't get it made like right away, in one mm -hmm. of those you have to like really sit down and. And, and kind of go through it. Cause I have gone through a lot of tutorials, but for some right reason, I just, it's like having a writer's block, but for me, it's a music producing block. And so I was like, well, maybe it's the the da. So I was like, I went and tried a different, I went to FL studio for a minute and then right. kind of yeah. looked at like Cakewalk, which is his other one that mm -hmm. popped up. And I just, I know that everybody, well, specifically I'm huge into electronic music. So I know Ableton and FL studio are the like, Side top. by side. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, it doesn't make sense for me to look at these other ones that are not even as good. So maybe I'll, I'll pick it up soon. Um, well, it depends on what you're doing. If you're doing like loop based music, um, uh, you know, Ableton, you're able to do loop based music, but you're also able to record straight tracks also. Um, and and depending on what you're doing, like you know, if you're if you're laying down like some some drum, uh, some MIDI drum stuff or some drum loops, and then you want to play your saxophone over it, I would, you know, I would tell you to do that in the session view, um, okay. which is where you can lay down straight tracks. I think the arrangement view is where it's, it's um, uh, loop based. So maybe you don't want to concentrate so much on the loop based stuff. You want to concentrate on the stuff where you're tracking. 
So um, focus more on that. That might help you. Yeah, I think it's also because I'm kind of going to give away my ideas here, but um, I might it's specifically the genre of trance music in electronic mm -hmm. music, which is I, I most would say that like the classical music of electronic music. It's very melodic and emotional music. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people kind of have already kind of doing the idea I have, but I have some, some, hopefully I want to make some, my own kind of remixed arrangements of some old classical, some of my favorite classical and operatic music, but in sure. with, with trance influence, maybe BPM which can get up to 140 ppm but i don't know if i'm going to go that far <laughs> um, that's pretty fast yeah, yeah um and i, I don't want to take away the integrity of the original tracks so those are some of the ideas i have but i think because i want to get to that level and it's just i'm gonna have to take some time to like really learn ableton and figure it out yeah you know and, and like look don't beat yourself up if you're having a hard time with it it's it's not you know a lot of these music programs you need to be an engineer to understand how to use that's why i actually like ableton i find it very user friendly and there's like i said you just gotta like dig around find some tutorials that can help you get started and um don't beat yourself up remember it's you know you're you're learning something new it's like speaking a new language yeah i'm which i also do i speak languages but that's a whole other thing so I want to talk about your podcast because okay. I, um, I was really intrigued about, I, I, I haven't listened to all of them, but okay. I've listened to your first one explaining Rolling Soldier and how that came right. about and um, how the process of that. And then I, I finished earlier uh, your interview with your wife about yoga and the and her <laughs> studio. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was intriguing. Uh -huh. And then also your interview, I can't remember his name, it's blanking, uh, but he wrote the book of, and he's a screen, well, a showrunner for like science fiction. Oh, um, Mark Sacre. Yes, Fa yeah. fascinating uh, for everybody yeah, listening. Yeah, this, really so check that out. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I know you have a lot of episodes, but what's, what's interesting I think because obviously we we've, we've met on social media because of the whole explosion of Lucifer and your appearance on there. But right. I'm intrigued about how. Well, it's inspiring to me that you 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 went and made the web series because in this day and age, I mean, I've been doing this podcast for like nine years, oh, and wow. I feel like nobody's listening, but people are listening. But oh, no, it's you know what? Like, you, you just if if you enjoy doing it, you just do it. You know, there's no. Yeah. Don't worry about who's listening. Who cares? You know? Yeah. And I think the issue is I have is in my evolution of this podcast, uh, Real Talk, is that when I started, I started as a hobby. It's been in different iterations. But the medium of podcasting has gotten so popular, specifically yeah. because of so many celebrities and well-known influencers and whoever, whatever you want to call them, now have one. And right. then, then last year with everybody being bored, everybody started one that didn't have one. So now, well, you know, it's funny. I, I started mine right before COVID and when COVID happened, it was something that I could do to keep me busy. Um, but I, when I made mine, it wasn't, I wasn't riding on the wave of COVID, but I understand what you're saying. Like a lot of people did, jump on the bandwagon and start doing one. And, you know, it's like everybody, everybody has a podcast. Um, <laughs> I did mine primarily because, you know, I wanted to kind of um, try it. I wanted to see if it was something that was, you know, uh, what I could, you know, I, I was kind of scratching my own itch to see if I could, if I could do something like this. But I also wanted to talk to people and understand things from their point of view. And, and um, especially like, you know, people that, that are in the industry, I wanted to get their, their take on things because I, I have my own take on things as an actor and also, you know, a producer and director and creator of a web series. But also I wanted to find out what it was like from a writer's perspective or from, um, you know, a cinematographer's perspective and, and just kind of get it, you know, 
or and other and other actor friends of mine that I that I've interviewed. Um, I wanted to get their take on things. Uh, and you know, it's funny when when COVID hit, I. I did a bunch of episodes. I did like 20 episodes, and then I decided after 20, I was like, you know what? I'm going to give it a rest for a little bit because nobody's really working right now, and um, and there's nothing really to talk about. <laughs> so, so I, I decided because my show is mainly about, I guess, I guess, working in the entertainment world and what it's like being an actor and and trying to navigate their way through through this, you know, insanity that's that's Hollywood. And, well, and because COVID shut everything down, there wasn't anything to talk about. So I, I decided to take a little bit of a break from, from my podcast, but you can get, you check it out. It's called the John <laughs> Tank show. It's on, uh, it's on <laughs> Spotify and, and, um, and, uh, Apple podcast, whatever thing it is, you know, it's there. You can, Everywhere you can, podcasts are found is what I usually say. Right. Yeah. You, you can probably find it. It's probably pretty easy to find. And there's some good episodes. Um, I, I talked to some good people. Uh, just Diana, I see your questions. We'll get to that in a second. Don't worry. I see it uh, all. Um, but the reason no, I don't get me wrong. I, I, I still love podcasting, but I just, I just, it's funny how <laughs> it's just easier for people that are already well known to be like really successful in the podcasting. And then oh, you yeah, get all yeah. these, then you have like really the nitty gritty of podcasting where it's people that are like grinding but, and yeah. But, you know, it, it's, it's, I think it's fun. Like I I've done, I've been interviewed by a lot of people on podcasts that, that um, I, I don't know how many listeners they have or, or subscribers. And um, for me, when somebody asks me if, to do something, I, I mean, I find that to be, you know, I find it interesting. Number one, anybody would want to talk to me. Uh, number two, uh, it, it's it's kind of it's kind of a nice honor to be able to to talk a little bit about you know what I do. Um, I guess it's interesting, um, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be concerned about about um, who's like you know you're not in competition with anybody. You know, just keep doing your thing and and you know try to have fun doing it. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry so much about you know whoever the new big podcaster is. You know, especially if they have. You got to remember, a lot of these people have a PR machine behind them, so they're they're able to get their their you know show out to more people than than. The, the regular person, but you're doing, you're doing, a, you know, something cool. You know, you're interviewing people and that might have a little bit of reach. I, I have a little bit of reach, you know, and I hope that some of the people that follow me will, will check this out and, and maybe you'll get a couple followers out of it. Well, definitely. I mean, I, I like, I'm honored that you wanted to, to be my guest because I actually for months have been like wanting to reach out and life got in the way, but, um, no, what I'm what, kind of what I'm getting at about your podcast is I, I think the reason why I found your podcast so intriguing is I'm also this type of person, if you haven't figured out, that I'm really into the inside baseball of things where I yeah. like to know. And I think you're, you're the, your podcast is intriguing because you're kind of giving an insight to the entertainment industry. And as much as the entertainment industry is well, from my limited time, point of view, it, it's, you know, I, I'm giving it, I'm giving an insider's view from, from my perspective. Where it's you know, I'm kind of one of those. I don't want to say a lower tier guy, but I'm not. I'm not a big player at all. Um, I, I'm I'm a working class actor, so I'm kind of giving my perspective, the working class actor's point of view. Right, but but what I'm getting at is, I feel like as much as I'm a pop culture junkie and yeah. I research stuff, we in the entertainment industry even more nowadays. You, you always you hear these interviews or these these sound bites of people being like, I have this thing coming out, but I can't tell you what it is. And it's always like, or I'm working on this. And, and I think, not that you can talk about what you're working on, but my point is, is like, I think it's cool that you do have the podcast that you can like, like a lot of people don't know kind of what cinematographers do or unless you like really research or what a, what a showrunner is, which is why I found 
Um, that very intriguing because I do kind of know what a showrunner is, but kind of getting that perspective and and I think it is interesting to a lot of people because yeah, we know the things are made and right. it's great to see them in, in its form, but I like the behind the scenes how you get there. And I think yeah podcasting you know, or or like it is a great way to like kind of explain that. Right. And, and I, you know, me too. I, I feel the same way. I, I, I enjoy knowing how things are. I, I, I like knowing how the sausage is made also, you know, um, you know, uh, to me, it's a miracle. Anything gets done in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like the, the chances of things ever getting made are, are like ridiculous. Um, so, you know, seeing, seeing things that, that, um, that get, they get made are always are always crazy, um, and and I know how much work goes into things, which is which is you know fascinating to me. Um, uh, so yeah, you know it, it, it's it's uh, it's fun to talk about. It's fun to it's fun to kind of dig in and, and understand how things are done. I do want to get to the question that's related that um, Diana posed in the chat about do you have an other than your own what other podcasts do you listen to well um i like uh wtf with mark Marin. if we're going to yeah. talk about the ones so that, that i like that one probably more than anything else i also like to listen to tim ferris um uh although i haven't really listened to him that much um but one of my my favorites because it's one of my favorite subjects uh, I love Star Wars, so uh, Around the Galaxy um, uh, by Pete Feltzer is is probably He's the here best. You're watching, apparently. Um, oh, there, yeah, I see. There he, he just popped up. What's up, Pete? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his podcast is probably, in my opinion, the best Star Wars podcast. So if you're a Star Wars fan, listen to that one. That, that's that's the best, and he's great. Uh, I, I did an episode with him, and we had a great time, and. Um, uh, that's a fun one to listen to. But, um, other podcasts, you know, I, I like I like interviews. Um, I don't I don't really I haven't really explored some of the the, the scripted ones or anything like that. Um, or you know I you know some of the, like the true crime ones are fun, uh, but most of the things I, I listen to are the interview ones. Um, I'm trying to think who else I like. Um, you know, of course, everybody that's ever had me on their podcast, you know, those guys are all great, you know. So, you know, I want to make sure that I give them <laughs> shouts out, too, you yeah. know. Uh, but uh, as far as, like, who I like to listen to the most, it would probably be what, you know, WTF with Mark Marin, Tim Ferriss, and Around the Galaxy. All very good. Um, yeah. I just can't, and, and, you know. And Matt Del Negro's uh, uh, 10,000 Nose is really good, too. That's a good one. He's oh, a friend yeah. of mine. I, I'm so behind on Conan O'Brien's need, needs a friend, but nice shout out here in the chat. Um, no. <laughs> uh, I can't, one of my favorites has grown, and I know it's, by the way, none of these are sponsors, <laughs> but <Okay. laughs> I just want to put that out in case people think. But um, Armchair Expert with Dax Shepard and Monica Padden. Um, in fact, they just cool. released an. Uh, an episode today with Barack Obama, but uh, oh, cool. I, he was an anthropology manager before he became an actor. And what I love about his podcast is that he dives deep and he likes to like get into like the psychology and, of, of people. And I, not to really continue to make their podcast as huge as it is, but it, it I just can't get it. Like I can't, I'm behind, but it's such a great podcast. So if, yeah. if people, it's all. It's now exclusively only on Spotify, so you might want to check that out. But okay, yeah, that sounds good. I'll I'll, I'll look into that one for sure. Um, awesome. So my next thing, kind of, I also want because I mentioned uh, your interview on your podcast with your wife, and and what what I found intriguing about that was I, I haven't listened to all of them, obviously, but okay. uh, she talks about how practicing yoga is such a um, helpful thing in your profession. And I know you're not like hardcore about it, but 
Mm-hmm. And I haven't obviously caught up on your podcast, but can you talk about, you know, because people always make the joke about Hollywood and people going to yoga studios. Yeah. But I think I think there's real value into either yoga or meditation, specifically in your, your line of work. Because you talked about how it can be really stressful at times and very, like, yeah. unstable. Very. So. It's very stressful because it's, it's so unpredictable. Um, and things like yoga. Here's the thing. And any physical exercise is good for you. Um, I, I'm a martial artist. I studied Shotokan karate and I studied uh, MMA and, and I've done martial arts for a long time. I've taught martial arts for a long time. Um, and the value that you get from those things are, are, are really good, especially if you're in an industry like mine where, number one, you've got to kind of stay on top of your health and fitness because, you know, when you're on camera, you want to look good. Um, but you also have to have uh, you got to be grounded in something. And um, like my wife, uh, she's a very well-known yoga instructor in in Los Angeles and in Hollywood. And she's we've got one of the most popular yoga studios in L.A. And thankfully, and, and um, she's an amazing, amazing teacher. Um, and, uh, you know, yoga is one of those things... I'm not a practitioner um, because it's just one of those things that I, I just never gravitated towards. Um, maybe you know later on I'll, I'll I'll start to kind of pick it up. In fact, I've been wanting to kind of do something you know a little bit slower since you know I'm, I'm older now. Martial arts is is hard on the body, um, but things like yoga um, are very important uh, for for what, you know, for the kind of work that I do. And I do kind of like a little bit of yoga with stretching and and that kind of thing. Um, But uh, yoga and meditation are are probably two of the things that you're just um, when in Hollywood when it comes to, you know, actors relaxing and and getting centered and getting focused to be able to do their work. I study transcendental meditation. I practice transcendental meditation. Um, that's helped me out a lot. Um, it helps clear my mind, and it also helps kind of keep me calm. I'm, I can be kind of a, a high-strung person. You know, if you ever watch any of the work that I do, um, I, I play a lot of stressed-out people, <laughs> um, and that's probably not too far from you know what my real life is like. I, I tend to be a kind of guy who, um, you know, yeah, it, th- those things are easy to access for me because um, just of, because of who I am. But in order to relax enough to be able to do that kind of work, meditation and some kind of physical, uh, you know, fitness activity um, really helps. And I think yeah. that's why you hear about it a lot. Is, is because those, you know, they really help performers, you know, they keep us in shape and, and they keep us centered and focused and our brain right. And, and um, you know, it, it's the, the, those, those things are valuable. And it's, and, you know, we, we get ragged on a lot in the press or, or in the media and, you know, and people are, you know, oh, these LA actors with their yoga and all and meditation and all that there's a reason we do it. And if more people, you know, practice these kind of things, their lives might actually, you know, kind of improve. Um, it's not just, for, it's not just for, you know, actors and musicians and singers and, and people like, that, you know, performers. It's, it, it's actually for everybody and it's beneficial for everyone. So Diana talks about fitness activity and she, her question is, have you practiced Tai Chi or I don't even know how to pronounce it. I'm not going to butcher it, but, <laughs> um. um, yeah, uh, I, I've done a little bit of Tai Chi with my martial arts stuff. Um, I try, you know, I, we would incorporate a lot of Tai Chi into our opening kind of stretching exercises to get warmed up. Um, Tai Chi is a great, um, uh, form of martial arts. It's also a great form of, moving meditation. Um, I highly recommend anything that, that puts together physical activity and also um, 
some kind of uh, um, breathing and mindfulness. And what kind of prompted you to study martial arts? I know you um, probably studied it before, like the big popularity of when I was MMA, in New but... York. When I when I left college and moved to New York to pursue a career, my first manager um, told me I was fat <laughs> and I needed to get in shape, and I hated going to the gym. And I remember. I, I used to walk past this martial arts studio on my way to auditions, and um, so I poked my head in to see what the story was, and I took a free class, and after that, I was hooked. Um, I loved it, and uh, and I and I wanted to do the kind of work. Yeah, you know, I, I wanted to be in projects that that did a lot of actiony kind of stuff, and having a martial arts background was something that I thought would would kind of you know. Uh, augment what I wanted to do. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued because I, I've, in a lot of the podcasts I've listened to, I've heard that that's kind of um, helped a lot of actors um, is be practice some sort of martial arts. I know Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. does it. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And uh, many he's other. A, um, Robert Downey Jr. is a Wing Chun guy, and that's mm -hmm. a very cool style um yeah i mean it's it's good for you um it keeps you in shape uh keeps you healthy um it also you're also learning how to defend yourself you know which is really important um i you know and as a, as a teacher i taught for almost 15 years you know the most important thing is is learning how to walk around with confidence so you don't get attacked or, or, you know, become a victim. Um, and uh, having a martial arts background could save your life. Um, so there's some important lessons you learn from that. And, um, and it's just a lot of fun. Um, you know, <laughs> it, it can be a little bit uh, rough at times, but um, for the most part, you know, Studying a martial art can be a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, we have some comments in the chat about discipline, about how the, uh, they it, do it as well. I, yeah, I mean, you get so many benefits from it. You get discipline from it. You get uh, mindfulness from it. You get physical fitness from it. You get a sense of um, uh, um, oh God, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, confidence. There's all kinds of things that come with it, um, and, and it's 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 you know it depend and it also depends on your teacher and and you know it has a lot of benefits that I recommend. Yeah, so we have a couple more questions here. That's good. Um, so, <laughs> Margie says she's listened to every one of your episodes of podcast. So now that you're busy getting into acting again, now that COVID's kind of hopefully behind us, is that going to just be kind of a hobby or <laughs> what well, first of all, your First of all, Margie is, is, is I just want to say hi to her. She's, a, she's always been a very supportive person and I love her very much. Thank you for all that support that you've always given me. Um, uh, the podcast, I, I, right now I, I don't have any, I'd like to start it up again. I just, it's just about finding the time to get around to doing it. Um, since uh, they've lifted the ban in Los Angeles, the the mask ban, um, we've uh, we've seen a lot of um, there's been a lot of activity. A lot of stuff has started shooting again. Uh, I just traveled to New Jersey to visit my family, but right before I left, um, the week before I left, I had seven auditions, which is a lot. And then yesterday I had three auditions in one day. So um, wow. things are, yeah, things are definitely picking up. I'm hoping that I book one of these gigs. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, things, things are definitely picking up. And uh, you know, if I can find the time to do some, some new podcasts and get some more guests, uh, I'd love to do that. Awesome. Yeah, I actually spent 2020 in LA. 
Uh, oh, cool. I had moved there right before the lockdown, so that was fun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> interesting year to be in LA. Right. Um, yeah. Very. <laughs> but so I guess what I, I want my next kind of questions would, would be around because of that, for those that may listen to this in the future or watch this, be, to kind of go back to what we talked about, you just making your web series. And, and mm. I love how like on a lot of your social media profiles, you say you make your own luck. Um, yeah. What do you, any advice that you could give to anybody that is still apprehensive about just doing the thing or writing the thing or whatever it may be? Yeah, it's hard. Um, I don't know if you can hear my dog in the background barking. That's Lila. She's <laughs> doing her oh. thing. Um, <laughs> as far as um, you know, moving forward and creating a project of your own, or 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 even starting a project, the hardest thing is starting. Really, um, I struggle with it all the time. So um, I'm no expert, to be honest. Um, when I made the Rolling Soldier, I did it out of necessity because I needed to, to reinvent myself as an actor. And um, I wanted to be seen in a certain way that I wasn't being seen, so I created the vehicle for myself to do it. Um, but as far as you know, creating and um, making something, creating you know, a project or creating a piece of art or, or putting yourself out there, the first step is always the hardest. And you got to realize that you're not alone, you know, with it. You got to realize that there are everybody out there is, is, uh, having a hard time, you know, getting started with something. Um, but if I, if I could give any advice about how to do it, um, I guess I would say, you know, choose something that you're super passionate about that you really know really well. And, things about it that love the most talk about it and do it um, start telling your friends around you that you're going to do it because they'll start holding you responsible for it uh, that'll help um, and then call in the favors you know ask ask the people around you if they can help you um, and then you know see where it takes you you know you might learn the thing about you, what, what I learned the most about the Rolling Soldier I, was um, I, I always knew that that I was you know a, a pretty good actor. I, I knew I could I could act, um, but I didn't know I could uh, write. And I didn't know I could direct and, and produce. Um, so I learned a lot about myself in that area. I, I was able to figure it out. Some somehow I figured it out, um, and. The only way you can do that is by by doing it. There's there's no other way of getting around it. You can sit and you can talk about it all day long, but until you start to put it into action, um, you know, you, you got to at some point you have to say, you know, and, and, and I don't mean to be crude, but you got to either shit or get off the pot. You know what I mean? It's either you do it or just you know, you're going to be talking about it for the rest of your life. So my, it's about, you know, gaining the courage and just doing it and realizing that it might not work, it might fail. You might completely make an ass out of yourself, but I think you'd be much more happier in life knowing that you tried than, than not trying at all. That's my advice. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I might be venturing into another project away from you the should. podcast. Yeah, cool. um, go for it. So that I might be an announcing soon. So uh, that's kind of a personal question on my own. Um, but go thank you. Just, just just do it. And you know what? Don't listen to anybody's opinion. People's opinions are are who cares? You know, who cares what your mom and dad say? Who cares what your friends say? Nobody. They, who gives a shit? Just do it. Really, I mean, their opinions don't mean anything. Yeah, Just I've learned do that. It. <laughs> do it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people haven't, specifically my family, to kind of 
go back. They haven't understand why I've been doing this podcast for almost Who cares? years. Who cares what they and, think? I, and I just kind of go, and they're starting to understand it now because I guess it's taken nine years for them to understand it. But don't worry about it's it. Because, yeah, it's one of those things where it's like I just have learned just to just keep doing what I do. <laughs> if you enjoy it, that should be good enough, you know. And if they don't understand it, then it's not for them. Who cares? Yeah. Really, I mean, honest to God, like. Who cares? Exactly. Do, do what you want to do and have fun doing it. And if you can make some kind of a living or, or something off of it, then that's awesome. That's gravy. Like a lot of times, look, you know, as an actor, I don't, you know, I, I struggle with, with making money and with, with you know, um, I'm not always rolling in dough. It's just, you know, I have, most of the time I'm being rejected. 99.9% of the time I'm being told no. And my life is about just wading through the rejection and finding, you know, you know, finding the gold. Um, so, but, but that's my passion. That's what I want to do. And, you know, my advice to anybody, you know, who's, who's trying to pursue a career in the arts is don't listen to anybody. Just do what you want to do and don't let anybody stop you. If you're serious about it, if you're not serious about it, then you might want to consider doing something else. To kind of piggyback off of that. Yeah. Do you think the last year and just kind of how people kind of had realized, oh, entertainment can shut down, like, well, the production of it, not necessarily what was already made, but... Yeah. Um, and the fact that like you you created your own web series and there's a lot of people creating a lot of independent films and, and TV shows and because streaming is such a big part of our lives now. Yeah. And in fact, I don't know if you know, do you have you watched um, the latest special on Netflix by Bo Burnham inside? Oh, that was amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. If if any of you guys are watching this or listening to it, watch that. Yeah. And you'll see what it takes, number one, to do something, to, to create something on your own, but also the toll it takes on the person at the same time. Um, that, that special was heartbreaking and hilarious and phenomenal it, it, all across the board. He, that guy should get every award. I mean, he really, he really nailed it about what it's like to be an artist, but also be an artist during the pandemic. Um, I totally agree. I've been a Bo Burnham fan. See, he went, he started in YouTube virality back when I was in college. And so yeah. I've been following his career for what, 14 years now. Yeah. And when I saw he was releasing a new special and then the fact that he wrote it, directed it <laughs> and yeah. edited everything. it. He did everything, yeah. and it's and probably one of the best things. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he he was this guy who he, it's so raw and it's so just unfiltered, and he put himself out there, and it's so original and it's just so beautiful and unique. And that guy's mega talented. I mean, he's just that's like a once in a lifetime kind of talent right there. Um, and I, I did not know who he was until my daughter introduced me to him. My daughter said, can we watch this? And I was like, yeah, there's nothing else on. Let's check it out. And I was blown away. Um, that's one of the best things I've seen all year. What, probably one of the best things I've seen in a long, long time. Highly recommend. Yeah, Thumbs I also up recommend, that guy. Yeah, I also recommend his other specials like uh, that are on Netflix as well. Yeah, I'll have to um, check those out. Yeah, just because the musical comedy aspect of it. I think I fell in love because I love comedy and I love music and he's brilliant at both. Yeah, um, it, it, yeah. It, was, it was really, really cool. Yeah, um, not to be like, again, not sponsored, but uh, recommend for everybody. I highly recommended. Yeah, all right. Well, I don't want to keep you too long, but this is, this like hour has flown by and I want to thank everybody. But before we, Leave. I do want to go back to some questions that were in the yeah, chat. Yeah, let's get some questions in from anybody who's uh, who's tuned in. So Diana asked, "Is there any instrument you would want to learn to play that you don't already?" I guess um, I'm adding that last part. Sorry. <laughs> uh, hmm. 
maybe um, I, I, piano is something I wish I was was good at. I mean, I just program MIDI notes is what I do with when I create synthesizers or piano parts. I wish I could play it. Um, I wish I could play, um, um, I don't know, a xylophone maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, drums would be fun to know how to play too, I think. I recommend, because actually I forgot that I also know how to play this instrument. can't believe I keep forgetting. I play uh, steel drums. I miss that. Oh, really? Um, That's cool. Yeah, I started that in high school and played a little bit in college and then put it down to just focus on school and saxophone. And then every That's time I hear cool. steel drums or like somebody putting what I think is probably something from Ableton in a, in a track now, I'm like, yeah. oh, I miss that. I wish yeah. I was on that, playing that instrument. Awesome. And then along those lines of music, there was another question about what is the best concert you've seen in person? Oh, well, God, that's, that's a loaded question because I've seen so many. I, um, I think the best concert I've probably ever seen was um, when Roger Waters uh, came back and did the wall tour. Wow. That was incredible. Um, I mean, from the beginning to the end of it, I, I've never been to a concert that had that kind of like theatricality to it. It was, it was just unbelievable. Uh, but from a, you know, from a, like a visceral standpoint, like uh, like full on, like, you know, out of body experience, rock and roll experience, um, you two, I saw I saw the Joshua Tree the first time when that when the album came out, and that blew my mind. And then I saw them, you know, thirty five years later yeah. when they did it again, and that blew my mind. Um, seeing um, uh, Underworld perform for the first time uh, at Coachella was amazing. Bunk was amazing. Anytime, you know, I, I, uh, and then like the. When to reunited with the original lineup, I mean, I was I was out of my mind. Like, I had that was one of the best times I've ever had in my life. But I mean, I've seen so many people. Um, the Rolling Stones, David Bowie, um, Pink Floyd, um, REM, the, uh, the countless Grateful Dead concerts. I mean, uh, it's it's hard to say just one. But but if I had to really pick one that blew me out of my socks, it would be the wall for sure. Okay. Since you mentioned it and this last year was a big deal, let's talk about Daft Punk for a second. <laughs> yeah. First of all, RIP to them breaking up, but not that they've yeah. really been, they haven't really been touring for a long time anyway, or right. they've been producing and doing their own stuff. But you know, when that was news months ago, like last year, the chatter online was funny about it because all of us that kind of grew up with Daft Punk or always wanted to see them live but never did yeah. when when they were touring because like it was hard to get a ticket to anything that they were doing, especially yeah. in their heyday. Do you agree that for electronic music, I mean, there are a lot of people we could go down this rabbit hole, but for Daft Punk, to bring electronic music, other than like maybe Tiesto and and Paul Oakenfold and some others, I feel like Daft Punk did a great deal to bring it mainstream and to kind of have oh, more yeah. of a coll collaborative. And specifically when they went into like music scores for like Tron years ago, yeah. and mm -hmm. can to kind of go back to your concert going when seeing them, what what was like? Do you remember the vibes when seeing them live? Because well, you know, you know, with their helmets and the whole yeah. vibe that they have. Well, nobody really knew what to expect. Uh, it was at Coachella. It was um, that was a good weekend because it was um, Depeche Mode and Daft Punk and um, oh god, who else? Madonna. Um, what well, was that year? There was a lot of like it was an amazing it was an amazing lineup that year. Uh, and the year before that was even better, but um, 
that that performance, um, you know, you know, <laughs> at the time, I mean, I, I, you know, when you're at a festival, you like to partake in certain things, and um, I definitely was partaking. And when we went to see Daft Punk, we didn't really know what to expect. Um, and I remember when before they came on. You know, the we were in a tent. It's a big giant tent at Coachella that they played at. It was like where all the electronica acts always played in the in this dance tent. So uh, the tent went black. Every it was, and then all of a sudden, this huge pyramid lit up in the middle of the in the middle of the floor, and they were inside the pyramid, and they were. Oh, I remember and they, hearing they, about that. They just it, it just went off. It, it they broke everybody's brain that night. It, it was incredible. Um, it was, inc I've never seen people dancing harder or just losing their minds more. <laughs> it was, it was fantastic. That was an amazing experience seeing that live. Like that, that I, I'm, I, that's kind of like a badge of honor that I can like say that, you know, I saw Daft Punk at Coachella and it was out of control and everybody was out of their heads and we had an amazing time. It was, it was, that was an amazing experience. Yeah, I, I'm starting to get a list of artists that I call musical geniuses that I will never see live because A, they've either broken up or passed away. Yeah. And I actually put Daft Punk on my list of Michael Jackson, Prince. Yeah. The Prince um, is somebody I never got to see, which I'm really kind of upset that I never got to see Prince. I never saw yeah, the so I, I never saw the Beastie Boys either, which also really bummed me out. Um, and I never saw... <laughs> I never saw the Ramones live, which also is another thing that really bummed me out. Yeah, so there's just like, I have this list of people that I'm like, I wish I could have, yeah. but either. <laughs> um, all right, well, before we get out of here, I want to thank everybody for tuning in live and all your wonderful questions. And uh, thank you, John, for joining me. It's, it's oh, been it's a lovely, lovely chat. Yeah. And just like the Lucy fans said this past weekend, We'll always be in your corner, whatever. <laughs> we'll be supporting you no matter what. Um, so everybody, this will be Thank up on the much. podcast feed starting next week. And um, the video replay will be available immediately after we finish tonight for th those to share around. And again, thank you everybody for tuning in and be safe everybody so we can keep enjoying concerts because I need one in my life. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks everybody. Have a good night.